Hey, hey, this is Cedric Youngleman, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. For those of you that celebrated, I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with your friends, family, and loved ones. After an amazing dinner that my wife prepared from scratch, I got to watch The Matrix with our 11-year-old son for his first time, and he loved it. So that was a raging success and a personal highlight. Today's episode with Dr. Jeff Ross, the founder and managing partner of alternative asset manager Valshire Capital Management and Valshire Partners, as well as a board-certified diagnostic radiologist, is brought to you by Alpa Energy Bars, a new kind of energy bar. Live life untamed. Question everything. If you don't believe everything you're told, break the rules. Strive for freedom. Reach for your peak and don't follow the mainstream. Then you're one of us. We question everything, including what real health is. Alpa bars are made with high quality Colorado grass fed beef, American sourced fruits and nuts and nutrient rich beef tallow. The Chad of energy bars, challenging the norm and supporting freedom. Use the link in the show notes or go to eatalpa.com now and use the code matrix for 5% off your purchase. This episode is also brought to you by River. River is the Bitcoin exchange of choice for the long-term investor. Securely buy Bitcoin at the tightest spreads in the industry. Have peace of mind thanks to their 100% full reserve cold storage custody and enjoy zero fees on recurring orders. Need help? They have U.S.-based phone support for all clients. Invest in Bitcoin with confidence at River. Use the link in the show notes to get started now. Up next, new sponsor, Thea. Your Bitcoin deserves the best protection. With Thea, you're in charge. No more fears of losing your keys or falling prey to hackers. Their self-custody multi-sig vaults empowers you to be the ultimate guardian of your Bitcoin. Share the power of secure Bitcoin with your loved ones. Thea enables shared custody, making it a family-friendly choice for safeguarding your digital legacy. And for those unexpected moments, Thea's got your back. Their multi-device vaults with both assisted and sovereign recovery options mean that your Bitcoin is safe, always accessible and ready for the future. Thea is more than an app. It's your partner in the Bitcoin journey with 24-7 support from a team that cares. Download Thea now using the link in the show notes and get your first six months free and experience the new standard in Bitcoin multi-sig security. Hodler's Official is having their biggest sale ever for this Cyber Monday. Use the code MATRIX at hodlersofficial.com right now and get an extra 5% off for a total of 26% off and free shipping to the U.S. and Canada. If you want to rep Team Bitcoin, this is the opportunity to get a jersey for the absolute best deal. Link in the show notes. Where's the beef, said? Well, I'm glad you asked. Circle Six Ranch has proudly partnered with the Beef Initiative, the Bitcoin Matrix, and Bitcoin Bay to offer you a taste of black Angus beef that's grass-fed, antibiotic-free, and steeped in tradition. Discover their premium beef selections like the Florida Pasture Beef Box and join a movement that's restoring Florida's local economy one steak at a time. Link for a discount can also be found in the show notes. The Florida Beef Initiative and Bitcoin Matrix energy secured with exceptional flavor in every succulent bite. At the Bitcoin Advisor, I'm now here to help clients with their multi-sig setup to buy and secure real Bitcoin for decades to come while ensuring you can sleep at night with the right estate planning and asset protection strategies to make sure your Bitcoin is safe for you and your family. My goal is to help you get your Bitcoin off exchanges, simplify the process, address your Bitcoin challenges, and ensure you feel confident every step of the way. If you or someone you know needs help buying Bitcoin and creating a multi-sig vault, I'm here to help. Ready to dive in and learn more? Simply head over to the bitcoinadvisor.com forward slash Cedric and book some time on my calendar. I'm more than happy to hop on a call and see how I can help you. And now, let's enter the Bitcoin matrix with macroeconomic guru, Dr. Jeff Ross, for brilliant discourse on markets, finance, 
growth investing, volatility, inflation, portfolio allocation, the future of Bitcoin cycles, and the psychology of investing. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Dr. Jeff Ross is an investment advisor representative, board certified radiologist, and fellowship trained award winning interventional radiologist. Jeff Ross is also the founder and managing director of Valshire Capital Management and Valshire Partners. Valshire is a registered investment advisor created by Dr. Ross to grow and protect its clients' wealth via wise and innovative investment strategies using a full cycle macroeconomic approach. Dr. Ross specializes in the healthcare technology, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin infrastructure sectors, as well as underappreciated U.S. and international assets with macroeconomic tailwinds and substantial growth potential. Passionate about investing wisely and teaching others to do the same, Jeff is a former contributor for The Motley Fool and Seeking Alpha. Valshire Capital Management utilizes an innovative, all-weather, full-cycle portfolio management strategy for its clients. Valshire's full cycle investment approach aims to achieve the highest possible portfolio returns in whatever macroeconomic conditions are present, either in the United States or around the world. Dr. Jeff Ross, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? Hey, thanks, Cedric. I'm happy to be here. I'm doing well. Thanks for inviting me on to your great show. Sure. Uh, well, I'm excited to get into it. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. I know on Twitter, you're known as kind of the bear or Dr. Bear. Uh, but we'll table that and we might not even get into that. Let's just see where it goes. But I'd love to kind of go back a little bit to the beginning and uh, hear a little bit about uh, how you became a radiologist and and maybe at a high level, what is radiology? OK, cool. Yeah. So um, first of all, I'll, I'll, we can we can get to this later. I'm not a bear anymore. I haven't been a bear since January of this year. So I've been a crab. So Dr. Crab has been my moniker. But anyways, how did I get into radiology? So so way back in college, I had to decide um, between did I did I want to go into finance or did I want to go into medicine and become a doctor? And, um, you know, after some soul searching and thinking about things, I decided to be a doctor. So I went down that route, went pre-med. It was a biology major. Um, and then, uh, you know, spent a, actually spent two years before I applied to med school. I went over and lived in Jerusalem for uh, about nine months working as a, a nursing assistant in a hospice there, which was really cool. Uh, and then um, uh, ended up going to med school um, in Minnesota. And then did residency and a fellowship in so radiology was my residency and then it's called diagnostic radiology and then a fellowship in something called interventional radiology which is sort of the surgery side of radiology and it's more like image guided minimally invasive surgery um, so most people know about that if you if you think about people that get stents put in their arteries um, that's that's one form of interventional radiology so um that that took quite a while. I started the whole process in the early 90s and, and got out of training in 2008 uh, and then moved my family to Colorado Springs. And we've been in Colorado Springs since then. So about 15 years here. It's been great. Sure. And then you asked, what is a radiologist? So real quick, a radiologist, I'm the doctor who, when you go in and get a CT scan or an MRI or an X-ray or an ultrasound, I'm the guy, the doctor who looks at the images and then and then reads, interprets the images and creates a report that goes into the medical record. So if you come in, your knee's feeling funky and you get an MRI or something, I'll read you know the MRI and tell you what's going on with your knee from the inside. Understood. And yeah. so where did uh, the career in investing come from? Uh, was it always a passion and, and where did that start? Yeah. So I've always been kind of a numbers guy and always have loved investing and the whole concept of it. Didn't have much time to, to uh, pay attention to it while I was going through my training. It's a pretty intense, you know, I was working 60 to 80 hours a uh, week. And then we had three kids along the way too. So I was a pretty busy guy. When I got out of training and we moved to Colorado in 08, I think about a year after I started remembering that, I, oh, wait, I actually like investing. And then I was also making money for the first time after like 15 years of poverty. So I um, so started thinking about investing again. And probably 2009 or 2010, I started a blog just teaching people how to invest on their own. Um, and that's that kind of went sort of well. And then I got picked up by 
uh, Seeking Alpha, uh, uh, actually Motley Fool first and then Seeking Alpha and was writing investment advisory type articles for them. Um, that was a lot of fun and built up a kind of an audience from there of people who a lot of them were then like, hey, you know what? We like your style. I uh, love how you invest. Could you manage my money? And I was always like, oh, no, I'm just a doctor. I just do this kind of for fun on the side. Um, but it put a little, you know, a seed in my head. And so and so I, I started thinking about that. Well, what if I, you know, started a business and started managing money for people? Because I actually really like doing this. Um, so you know, fast forward a couple more years and I, I started Valeshire. I started this hedge fund uh, first and then started this RIA, uh, you know, where I was managing separately and managed accounts back in 2014 is when it started. Um, by 2015, it got to be so busy to do both um, radiology where I was on call every fourth night. So going in and doing surgeries uh, on a pretty frequent basis and then trying to run Valeshire. It got to be too hard to do that. I, I couldn't be hospital based anymore at that time. So in 2015, I actually retired from interventional radiology. So I didn't do the surgery side anymore. I was just a diagnostic radiologist. Um, and then uh, fast forward a couple more years, I went in and got my MBA in finance. Uh, I got a lot of grief from people. This isn't the main reason why I did it but, it, it, but it stuck with me because tons of people would make fun of me sort of and be like, you know, doctors are notoriously bad at investing. I, you know, how could you be an investment advisor or fund manager? I'm like, oh, whatever. So anyways, I went in and got my MBA in finance and, and, uh, and that was fun. It was actually enjoyable, especially after going through uh, medical school. Um, and the business side of things is actually kind of fun and, and pretty light and easy. And um, that was a lot of fun. Fast forward a couple more years and it got to be to the point where, um, like I said, it was hard to be at a hospital or at a clinic to do things. So I left the group I was at here in Colorado Springs. I was a partner in this group uh, and I started doing teleradiology. So you'll see behind me these monitors. There are six monitors behind me and I do teleradiology. So I read for a group uh, that's in another state, actually. And uh, I get on their hospital list and I read from home over there. That's my that's the side of the office where I'm a doctor. And here where I'm sitting is my Valeshire side where I do my finance business. So um, work from home, do both careers now. I, it's a great schedule. I'm very happy doing both things. And uh, I, I just it, it's kind of how my brain works. I, I have a hard time sitting still and doing just one thing. And I, I have too much uh what would the word be kind of ambition for better or for worse, where I just want to be doing something else and building something as well, kind of entrepreneurial. Uh, and so doing Valeshire and doing medicine meets, meets the needs of both, both of sure. my needs and wants. It's interesting because I think a lot of uh, people might even dream about, you know, being really good at their career, whether it's uh, being a doctor, a plumber, a lawyer, an accountant, and maybe being good at, uh, with numbers as well. And kind of, uh, finding that route to becoming a hedge fund manager or, or managing money, being recognized for that talent as well, that they also manage. Something else I thought was very interesting, and I think you you kind of left, I think, medicine for a little while to focus fully mm -hmm. on Valshire. And I think from what I gathered, that was, you know, merely to the way the business grow had grown, you had to manage sort of compliance and legal. So it wasn't just to give up medicine. It was to kind of just manage sort of the back end of this business that was growing. And so I want to kind of get at here with uh, being a financial advisor and um, a doctor is, you know, I think most people kind of look at doctors as sort of this altruistic, uh, do-gooding um, career and vocation. And a lot of people look at sort of um, managing money or running money as, as more opportunistic and, and maybe not as benevolent. And, and sort of what has been your experience sort of giving up the doctor hat and then you know, focusing full time on, on being, you know, helping people with their money. And, and what has your experience been like with that? So first of all, there's a lot of overlap between the two things. A lot of people are surprised that I do those things and think, how could you possibly do both of those things well? And it's actually not as hard as people think because there's a lot of similarities between the two. First of all, what's interesting is two of the most important things to people deep down is their health and their wealth, right? They, they're, they're worried about their wealth. They're constantly working to build up purchasing power to support themselves and support them, their, their family throughout, you know, so they can retire someday and then, and they don't want to outlive their money. They also are obviously highly concerned about their health, right? Nothing is more important to people than their health. And, and you don't really realize that when you're young, but as you get older and if your health goes out, uh, you suddenly realize how important that is to you. And so it's, it's those, in those two ways, uh, the, the connecting point in those two, um, uh, principles is that I wanted to be a counselor before all of this started. So before I thought about finance, 
science versus medicine, I actually was going to be a counselor because I just enjoy working with people, listening to their problems and kind of helping them through and leading a better life. And both of these tangents were our ways to do that, help them either with their health or with their wealth uh, and figure out how to kind of live a better life. So that's why the motto for Valshire, I, I you know, chose it 10 or more years ago, live well, invest wisely. And, um, and, and so I've sort of stuck with that. Um, another thing that's interesting and some more overlap is one thing I've noticed, and you've probably noticed this too, especially in the Bitcoin space, a lot of great investors and great investing minds are actually the engineering type people. So I think of Lynn Alden, Preston Pish, um, we, we could kind of go down the, 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 the list and think of Michael Saylor, you know, they, they have this engineering background and they think in terms of systematic processes, how to make things better and better, how to remove emotion from the investing process and, and, you know, grow your wealth or, you know, what are the best assets to invest in those kind of things, being a doctor and especially being a, a radiologist, I tell people all the time that being a doctor is like being a human engineer, not like I'm building people, but you understand the complexity of the human body. You understand the complexity of disease processes and how they affect the body and then how to hopefully fix the body and make it better and, and, and function at its highest capacity. That's kind of what a doctor does at sort of a funny engineering level. And so there is a lot of overlap between that engineering side of medicine, uh, just engineering in general and investing, having a systematic investment process where you're not emotionally based, but you, you, you know, have a system. Um, those people tend to make the best investors over time. So it's, it's not as hard as people think. And, you know, and it, you can make the transition. I've actually known lots of doctors who have gone into the investing side of the world and have done quite well. Um, yeah, so that that's how I got to be where I am today. That's that's why I can manage both things. It's it seems really different, and in some ways it is, but in other ways there's a ton of overlap. Uh, and I'm just having a ball doing it. I I'm I'm a big fan of if you're gonna live life, you might as well lead an interesting life. And, and why you know why just sort of fade into the background and and work and then and then die. I want to do things that are interesting and follow my follow my passions, follow my heart, and and hopefully take people along with me to enjoy the ride. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm kind of curious. So you, you took a, I don't know how exactly long it was off from radiology. And uh, I assume that was either pre or sort of during the pandemic. And, and you're kind of going back post pandemic. Have you noticed sort of a change in the atmosphere or anything uh, pre post of the, your, your sort of hiatus? Yeah, so I actually um, took this like sabbatical, I call it about a year and a half off. And that was from the fourth quarter of 2021 until uh, this last summer, so August of 2023. Um, it has changed. Uh, I, healthcare took a huge hit during COVID. It's it's I was um, and and I you know I hate to get too much into these kind of issues, but I was just absolutely embarrassed by the healthcare profession and the way it was handled from the top down uh, for COVID. Um, the, the, you know, all of, all of the, um, I, I, you know, I don't know if we want to open up this, this can of worms, but, you know, forcing the vaccine on people who didn't want to take it, the vaccine wasn't tested, uh, over the long run. There were, there are clearly lots of issues with it, lots of benefits as well. I don't, I don't really side far to the right or far to the left. That's just how I am. I tend to be kind of in the middle and think about both sides. I'm not anti-vaccine, but I'm also very much opposed to forcing people to do stuff that they don't want to do. I'm a libertarian kind of at heart, I'm a freedom maxi uh, above all else. So I was greatly disturbed by what happened. And I think that really hurt healthcare um, throughout this. And, and the fact that lots of healthcare providers who abstained from getting the vaccine were actually forced to quit. They were, they were you know, fired from their jobs. It, just a massive shortage now in healthcare. There already was a shortage and it just made it much, much worse. Um, it was just mishandled all the way around and, and super embarrassing as a doctor to, to see that happen. Um, I think it hurt uh, healthcare in ways that it'll take years and years to recover. So um, I have lots of opinions on that, but I don't, I don't know if we want to get into that too deeply. Probably not. I mean, we'll save that for another show. If it comes up, it comes up. I think you answered a lot of questions there uh, for me. So just thinking about though, health is wealth. And I, I'm thinking about sort of uh, your relationship with your clients. So what is sort of like, you know, your bedside manner for your clients. Um, how do you get them comfortable with new ideas, like things like Bitcoin or, uh, you know, your outlook on the markets? Good question. And so that that is funny. You know, I, I will say too, I, I have a, a bit of, I think I'm like on the autism spectrum. Like, you know, I would say I have some mild Asperger's. So it's it's a little hard for me to be real extroverted and to 
um, in real time, kind of be there for my clients. I think the way that I'm best at being there for my clients is to um, is through my writing. So every every month, I, I send out a monthly update to my separately managed account clients, uh, and every quarter, I send out a memo to my um, hedge fund clients. That's where I can sort of lay out my thoughts and my investment thesis, and here's my macro views. So I, I try to lay it out to them, and you know, and you know, talking about Bitcoin. I went through the my, my own Bitcoin journey back in 2016, 2017, 2018, the, that time frame, and didn't invest at all in that in, in Vailshire for my clients. But I learned a lot. I was also a DGN crypto trader. I, I affectionately call myself back then and went through that whole circus with the ICOs and everything. And I had, you know, 50 of these cryptos and all that nonsense and learned a ton through that and, and went through the boom and then went through the following bust after that. I tried to take what I learned from that and basically how I came through that and became just a, a hardcore Bitcoiner uh, and why I believe, you know, I, I developed these these beliefs that aren't n- nothing is new. Uh, you know, everybody in the Bitcoin community has gone before me. I'm standing on the shoulder of giants, but basically believing that Bitcoin is better money for a better world uh, and that it absolutely should be in everybody's portfolios. The least I could do as an investment advisor is get my own clients into Bitcoin. So it started out with a lot of resistance uh, early kind of in 2019, 2020. Uh, so we started just very small, you know, getting off zero basically to 1%. And some clients got it sooner, so we would increase their positions. But then over the months and quarters and years, just continuing to teach them. And then uh, one thing that was really interesting for me and for my Veilshire clients was about a year into it, I had you know all my clients who were opposed to Bitcoin and those who were f- in favor of it. And what was great is I had my Veilshire portfolios without Bitcoin and with Bitcoin, and I, I could just show them you know, you're very scared about volatility. You think it's going to go to zero. Um, uh, and and it obviously hasn't. But look at the returns and look at how you think there's going to be lots of volatility. But because it's an uncorrelated asset, you actually have less volatility in a portfolio, but much better returns. And so, you, you know, there's nothing like really good returns to convince people that this is something that they should be doing. Uh, so while I was teaching them about kind of the, uh, you know, the, the properties of Bitcoin, the superior monetary properties, um, we had the portfolio results to back it up. And ev- eventually almost everybody came on board. So now, uh, you know, I would say 99% of Veilshire clients are in Bitcoin, at least to some extent. And so we kind of keep uh, creeping up the the total amount in our overall portfolios for our Bitcoin exposure. So what I'm really interested in about here, though, um, so I really like the way you kind of look at the markets. It is kind of, to me, I feel like the way you were talking about sort of uh, very neutral, just kind of reading the signals and what you see. And so I'm kind of trying to get my head around if, if someone was to start trying to read the markets, maybe from a macro perspective. And they were thinking about how to maybe start their own fund with the idea of attracting future clients or just how to manage their own money. And I know none of this is financial advice, but how would you start thinking about allocating, say, like a hundred grand? And and not, I'm not so much worried about what you would put the money in, but like, where would we even start? Would we start talking about treasuries and the bond market or equities? Would Because uh, I'm assuming you have a lot of accumulated knowledge about this, obviously, but like, where does one begin to kind of a, to build this knowledge stack. Sure. So that that's a that's a deep question. So so let's see. Where do we start with that? How I view mac, macro from from its sort of fundamental view is I look at things like biz, the business cycle. Are we are we growing or decelerating uh, as far as GDP is concerned? What is inflation doing? Are we, are we seeing inflation? Is it disinflation? Are we seeing outright deflation? How do those things work together? How does the Fed respond to these kind of conditions? Uh, when you when you know these kind of con- conditions and can see where these trends are going, you can kind of predict what uh, currency is going to do, what the dollar is going to do. Is it going to be strengthening? Is it going to weaken? Uh, and what treasuries are going to do? Are they going to be you know our yields going to start rising or not? Um, and then on, and then overriding all of that, and this is something that I I, I focus on almost annoyingly, uh, so probably too much for some people, but is what what's liquidity doing? So there there's the concept of net liquidity in the US and then worldwide, like what is M2, the broad money supply doing, what are central banks doing around the world, those kind of things. All of those have a major impact on the the movements of different asset classes. 
And, and then there's, there's sort of asset classes within asset classes, right? So you can trade currencies if you want to. You can trade bonds if you want to. There's stocks, obviously. And among stocks, you can go U.S. and international or large cap, mid cap, small cap. You can focus on tech or you can focus on energy. You can you know forget all that and focus on Bitcoin and just think about Bitcoin and maybe Bitcoin miners. Some people get into the crypto nonsense as well. There's tons of different things you can do. And so what I do, I think from a base level, when I think about constructing portfolios, and this took me a few years to, to kind of get comfortable with, is I think what can actually outperform the growth rate of the monetary supply, right? So what moves everything over time is the debasement of currency, and the, which is directly correlated to the growth in the monetary supply. So, the, so what, what I mean by that is not just cash that banks create by, uh, when they create new loans. That's like the old school way of creating money. The newer way is basically just government borrows tons and tons and tons of money, trillions of dollars, in fact. And the way they do that is by issuing treasuries. So Janet Yellen is there issuing T-bills and notes and uh, treasury bonds. And that also creates, it's considered collateral, or basically for all intents and purposes, that is money in the system. As they create more and more and more of that, especially beyond the underlying basal growth rate, um, they're causing debasement to happen. So how is that debasement then reflected in assets around uh, the world? So some assets don't keep up with that, right? You can invest in bonds. So bonds were a reasonable investment during the bull market from 81 until 2021 or so. Uh, but that's over. I believe the bond uh, bull market is over. I think we're back into a bearish phase and it will probably last anywhere from 40 to 80 years. And I think for the most part, bonds are dead money except for shorter term trades. So you have to look at other classes. Is real estate going to outperform the growth rate or is you going to you know, lose purchasing power over time? Stocks, a lot of stocks can keep up with inflation and actually outperform it. Uh, but in the last 10 to 15 years, that's only been in tech stocks. So the NASDAQ stocks have done really well. And so I go through these kind of processes and I think, why would I have bonds in my portfolio if I think there's no chance that they're going to outperform uh, just inflation? And, and not, not just CPI, by the way. And I think I'm sure you've talked about this on your show before. You know, CPI is just the, the official inflation rate. But we all know that the true inflation rate and the, the, the basement rate, which I like to call it, is much higher than, the, than what the CPI level is. And so you have to come up with assets that are actually going to outperform uh, that basic level. Um, tech stocks have been successful at that. Lots of other stocks have not. Emerging market stocks have stunk for the last 20 years. They've just been in this crazy funk. Um, gold tends to be a stable store of value over time, and it's done a great job doing so for about you know four to 6,000 years, depending on how far back in the history you can look. Um, but most other asset classes just simply don't keep up with that. Housing has its has its waves, but it's so, so overvalued right now. Uh, commercial real estate is facing these issues as well. Can it keep up with that going forward? It's it's probably unlikely. Uh, and so I, what I do is think about all of these different things and think, okay, if if I think these, you know, I can I can list off ten asset classes that I think that are even though they're in traditional portfolios, there's no way they're going to outperform that debasement rate. So why would you have them in your portfolio to begin with? Uh, is the way I think about it. That's what has brought me to Bitcoin uh, because not only being a stable store of value, it's actually an appreciating store of value over time because of its perfectly scarce monetary supply. Uh, it's the exact opposite of fiat currency, right? Which is, you know, is perfectly debasing over time and it guaranteed to lose your purchasing power over time. So the most risk-free way to appreciate your purchasing power over time I think you have to be centered uh, around a Bitcoin um, thesis. And if you're not, you're going to have a really tough time uh, increasing your purchasing power over time unless you know, unless you have like the, you're, you're a politician and you can, you can uh, do some insider training uh, legally, or you're, you know, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan or a banker and you have the Cantillon effect working in your favor and you have the, the ears of Congress. If you're just a regular person, it is extremely hard to beat that debasement rate over time uh, unless you have some kind of uh, Bitcoin uh, standard within your portfolio. Fascinating. So then uh, why is managing volatility so important to your clients? I mean, we kind of covered growth there. So this drives me nuts, right? And I talk about this a lot. So volatility, and, and I, you know, I got my MBA in finance. I went through all these courses too. Volatility, I like to say, only equals risk in academia. So, so people in, in the academic side of finance call volatility risk. They're like, you can't be in that asset. Bitcoin, oh my goodness, it's so risky. And why do they say it's risky? Because it's volatile, right? It moves up, it moves down. What's cool about Bitcoin is, as we know, it moves up 
more than it moves down. So the, the volatility is skewed to the upside, but it's still volatile enough that it scares people. People hate losing money. I've learned this a lot. It's one thing I love investing personally, but managing other people's money is not very fun. Why? Because when the market goes down, so say I'm in a, I have a, a portfolio I'm super happy with. We have a very high, you know, Bitcoin um, related uh, uh, asset allocation. We're in some miners. We own Bitcoin. We have some micro strategy, things like that. We have bad months every once in a while. You can go down a lot. And what I've learned, I, clients, when they come on board, I'll talk to them and be like, just so you know, we tend to have um, portfolios with higher volatility than the normal 60-40 portfolio. We have months that are kind of crazy. Well, you know, it may go down 10%, it may go down 20% in one month. That's not that abnormal, you know? And so you need to be okay with that if you want to invest it. And I'll, I'll have literally across the board, all of my clients like, okay, I got it. Yep, sure, no problem. But then when it happens, they freak out, right? Because they're whatever, maybe they're 65 and they're retired and they're looking at their portfolio. And when you have your life savings that suddenly it drops 20%, that's really scary to people. And what they imagine then is it's, I've lost all that money forever and now I'm in trouble and what, what are we going to do? Um, that's the part that's hard for me. So getting all the way back to, you know, me being this counselor at heart and, and, and holding client's hand, it's tough for me because it's, it's stressful when your clients call you and they're stressed out. It makes you question yourself and question your own models. And I like to remove emotion from my process and my investment process, but they bring it back in and they introduce the emotion back into the portfolio creation process. And so some of the mistakes I've made as a fund manager and as an advisor has been when I've let sort of their emotions get reflected in how we do portfolios. It, it causes me to sell or to buy based on emotion, you know, based on fear or greed. And so I've tried really hard over the years to get that completely out of my process and have a systematic process that just come, totally removes emotions, you know, and, and I try as hard as I can on the front end to, um, to control that, you know, to let them know this is going to happen, that we're going to see that volatility, that volatility does not equal risk. In fact, that's the price we pay for outsized gains. And if we want to outperform the markets, you have to be okay with volatility. Uh, you know, and, and most people will get on board with that, but it's been a process. It's been a learning journey for me. It's, it's been, you know, it's, it's really easy, I think, to invest for myself. It's just fun and simple and I don't care about the volatility and I just keep, you know, dollar cost averaging into things. And when something gets cheap, like Bitcoin, I just dump money into it and don't care if it goes lower because I, you know, but my clients don't think the same. And so that's been a big, uh, a big um, transition for me is figuring out how to handle uh, clients along the way. One last point I'll make on that, just for people who are interested. I learned um, a good uh, piece of advice from Bill Miller, who's a famous fund manager, Bill Miller the uh, third. It's now Bill the fourth, who's who's running that fund. But Bill the third said, you know what? I can't control my clients. I can't control when they come in and I can't control when they leave. And I've basically learned to just let that go. And that's been for me a really freeing thing because what happens is I've noticed, and this is you know coming back full circle, why did I retire in 2021 from medicine? I was having a flood of clients come in. The Bitcoin market was doing well. Velshire was crushing it. Clients were just coming in left and right and it was great, but it was more than I could even handle. So I had to stop doctoring just to focus completely on these clients. Then came the bear market after that. And we, we hadn't done, you know, we don't, we usually outperform in the bull markets and then we underperform in the bear markets. It's just my, my lot in life, unfortunately. So I, so I, I lose a lot of clients too. And that's very hard for me. It's emotionally challenging for me to deal with that. Like I let these clients down and they're disappointed and it's frustrating for me and it's sad for me. And I know it's hard for them as well. That's the part I just have to learn to let it go and they'll come when they come and they'll leave when they leave. And all I got to do is just the best that I can do as a fund manager. Uh, and, and that's how they'll share will succeed over time. And it's, it's, it's done pretty well so far. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So then how do you think about the macro versus like the macro setup versus uh, a micro uh, TA dream or nightmare? So uh, you're looking at a particular asset, equity stock, bond, whatever it is, Bitcoin, and you're like, I really think this is going to go up or down hard and the macro is going in the other direction. So what I've learned, a couple things. First of all, I love macro. It's fun to sit around and talk about macro and I'm pretty good at it. Um, 
but macro can lead you astray too. And, and I, I will tell you that, you know, so through Valeshire, I have subscriptions to world-class macro analysts and I listen to all of them religiously, probably 10 every day. I, I have my schedule where, you know, starting early in the morning, I do it. Even when I'm doctoring, I'll have them on in the background and I'm kind of listening with half an ear. Um, and then, you know, on, on my other days, we'll listen. And so macro is awesome and it can guide you for having a solid portfolio performance, but it can also lead you astray. So case in point, what should have happened this year in 2023 is the, the U.S. economy absolutely should have gone into a recession. But what surprised tons of people, even the best institutional grade uh, analysts out there and including me, was we didn't expect this fiscal response. We didn't expect the U.S. to just have these massive fiscal deficits and pour tons of money into the economy. When the government is pouring tons of money into the economy and the consumer is getting, uh, you know, like uh, baby boomers getting their uh, social security checks that went up quite a bit because of the, the COLA adjustment, um, they, they are still able to spend a lot of money. And with the government pouring trillions of dollars into the economy, it's basically impossible to go into a recession when that happens. Uh, and so that was something that the models didn't predict. Uh, it's, it's, if you have a free market, it's actually easy, I think, or easier to see the cycles, to see the sine waves of where you have your accelerations and then your peaks and then your decelerations and your troughs and back and forth. And you can watch that whole balance. And I love looking for those sort of patterns. But what we can't predict is what are the, the what is the Federal Reserve going to do? What is Congress going to do? You know, how many treasuries is, is Janet going to issue and just dump into the economy? Who's going to buy these treasuries? You know, that's another issue. Like, so that's a, that's a thing that came up recently. Is she going to put out T-bills on the short end or is she going to put out a ton of long dated treasuries? Is that going to just royal the markets or are the markets going to lap it up and who's going to buy that? And so all of those kind of things, you know, I tell people all the time, America gets blamed in, our, in the troubles that people see in the U.S. They blame on free market capitalism. And I tell people, this is nothing, this is not free market capitalism. We have absolutely centrally planned, centrally controlled uh, economies and markets. We absolutely do not have free markets here in the U.S. or most of the world, actually. Uh, uh, Bitcoin, for its part, is the only true, I think, they're the truest form of a free market economy and market. Uh, it, uh, but, but, you know, U.S. stocks, bonds, currencies, uh, everything else that goes on. And so, so why do I bring that up? It's impossible to predict. I don't know what Jerome's going to do at his next meeting. I don't know what J Janet Yellen is going to do. And introducing that human component, and they have massive effects on the economy, uh, makes it much harder as a macro investor to, to figure out where flows are going and what, you know, what the dollar is going to do and what yields are going to do and how equities are going to respond. So, that was a really long-winded answer to say, you know, it's fun and it's it's challenging, and but the, the the wrench that gets thrown in there because of the central control and the inability to predict that makes it much more challenging. Sure, I can see that. And I'm kind of curious what the months are like, so or the monthly activity on the portfolio. So, you know, I wonder how you manage emotions. Sounds like some of it's uh, DCA, but. Uh, also, how do you deal with new information and throttling the portfolio either away or towards certain uh, sectors? And, you know, how do you deal with, say, excitement? So in 2016 or so, maybe you were like, we need to be 50 percent Bitcoin. And obviously, you know, it that wouldn't have been good maybe for the portfolio and, and, and volatility and things like that. And how do you, uh, you know, are there are there times where you are racing to the phone to make a trade or is it more calculated? Uh, is it, you know, how do you kind of deal with new information and, and you know, just because you want to move away from something that, you know, do you always know what you want to move into or, you know, or does that mean going to cash or how, how do sure. things like this get managed? Yeah. So I'm rarely racing to a trade. I, I don't do a lot of day trading uh, per se um, within the funds. And it, it really depends where the markets are going. Like one good example of, of how I make portfolio decisions, we'll get to Bitcoin eventually, but like, but one example is, you know, rates have gone much higher right now. The 10 year is sitting at four, four, you know, they got over five for a little bit. The, the, the T-bills are sitting at about 5.3%, the one month and three month. Um, I have not been interested in fixed income for basically the entire life of Valeshire until a few months ago. They finally got to the point where I was seeing rates that were high enough to actually be enticing from an income perspective. So I don't invest in treasuries generally. Um, but one thing we have been doing, we've been getting into corporate debt, senior loans, 
um, taxable municipal bonds, even high yield debt. Um, uh, and that, that has turned out to be a pretty good um, decision so far. Uh, we, when, I, when I combined that, so I went from a 0% allocation to about a 30% allocation where we were earning a, a combined yield of about 7.75% or so. Uh, and then um, uh, mainly because I think yields, uh, at least in the near term, had peaked. And so when I do a little bit of racing is when I watch what Yellen is saying, I watch what the, F the FOMC members are saying. You may remember a couple, like a month or two ago, where they were basically talking down rates. You, rates were starting to get kind of out of hand. They looked like they were basically going parabolic. And they were like, you know what? They all came out across the board and said, the, the markets are doing the tightening for us. We can all relax now. Let's settle down. And what that did is they basically talked the dollar into peaking and then rolling over. They talked rates into peaking and rolling over. And so I was watching that. And I said, you know what? This is a great time to get into these high yield kind of um, uh, instruments because we can earn a really solid income in the near term. Uh, and I don't think rates are going to go much higher. So that means, you know, when for, for investors that don't know this, as rates go higher, prices go lower and vice versa. That's how bond works. So we can lock in these higher rates and probably what's going to happen is prices will go lower and these and, uh, and the, excuse me, the rates will come down and prices will go higher. So we'll get some capital gains in addition to our locked in higher yields. Those are the kind of decisions I make kind of in the short term. When I see, when I see the officials doing things like that, I think, okay, we have, we have a good setup right now for fixed income for the first time. Another way I think about fixed income and, and sort of from a trading perspective is, um, you know, as 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 Treasury bills have been coming out, they've been getting absorbed by the reverse repo market. So money has been coming out of the reverse repo market. And and stop me if this is too boring or too deep, but it started the year at about two point five trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now it's below one trillion dollars. So about one and a half trillion dollars of issuance has been absorbed uh, basically by money markets for taking their money out of the overnight reverse repo market, purchasing these T-bills. Uh, but so that's been good. That's good for net liquidity. It means that net liquidity is basically coming into the system that's generally good for risk assets. We're on a timer though now because now we're below a trillion dollars and at the rate that that's depleting, it's probably gonna go down to zero or approach zero in Q1 or Q2 of 2024. I think when that happens, we're gonna see the bond markets get roiled. So this is another macro view. I'm looking at that as kind of a countdown. In fact, I tweeted this out like a week or two ago, kind of saying, okay, we were at 10, uh, uh, well, you know, we were over a trillion. Now we're in the 900 billion range. And so I kind of looked at like 10, nine, eight, seven. And so the way I think about that for my clients is we have these fixed income investments, but as the reverse repo market approaches zero, those are going to get more and more risky. And we're going to be at, um, I, I think at higher risk for serious problems in the bond market, that's going to roil. I think all of the markets, uh, basically equities, I think could get hit pretty hard. Real estate could get pretty hard. Um, that's when the Fed and other central banks will probably be forced to move. I don't want to be sitting, uh, be long fixed income instruments at that time and probably don't want to be quite as long stocks. So that's how I think about it from a macro standpoint. As that approaches zero, I'm going to lighten up our load and, and focus more on cash maybe move more into Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin could actually possibly get hit at that point too, because people will be searching for liquidity. Bitcoin is 24 seven, 365 available liquidity. So sometimes people have to pull it out of there and that can drop the price down. So that's just another example of how I kind of think about macro terms and how we manage portfolios uh, related to what, what the treasury is doing, what the Fed's doing, things like that. Sure. Yeah. And I did pull your tweet from uh, November 14th about what you're watching. And that was about the overnight reverse repo and how it dips back below one trillion. So uh, I was going to get to that eventually. Uh, so I'm glad you covered that there. And then uh, regarding sort of, um, you know, back to this idea of sort of portfolio allocation and, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at maybe uh, bonds or treasuries and these fixed yield products. And you're, you're thinking about, hey, I want to move into that a little bit. That That's sort of getting more attractive. Do you, do you ever find yourself in this situation though, where you're, you're the capital you want to allocate is limited? You're in other things you you don't want to get out of, and uh, you know, so you're not running from something. How do you then deal with maybe maybe you have more things that you want to be in than you can allocate capital to, or you struggle with you know uh, this one should be ten percent, this one should be five, or should they both be seven and a half percent? I spend a ton of time thinking about that. In fact, I have a lot of sleepless nights when I can't sleep. It's usually because I'm laying in bed thinking about portfolio allocation. And, you know, we only have a limited amount of dollars. And where are we going to put put those dollars? 
taking it a step further, I said, I'll get to Bitcoin eventually. So, so we're in the part of the Bitcoin cycle where things are going to start getting exciting again, right? I, I break it up into six month segment. We're in segment one of the six month blocks where I think we're going to basically have 24 months of bullish price, price performance. It gets more exciting as we get closer to the end, as we know uh, from experience. This is the segment where I think things are kind of choppy, generally trending higher. I put some tweet out about this too uh, a while back, um, kind of where we are in this segment, my, my outlook for the next 24 months. So why, why is this important? Because what I want to do for my clients, and, and I, so I spend time thinking about this, what do I take money away from to put it into Bitcoin and Bitcoin related proxies? Um, I have this these fixed income allocations that I was talking to. Uh, uh, to you about. And then also equities. I don't really like most other sectors. I think real estate is, is something to be avoided for now. And, and currencies without leverage, you, it, they're just not a, a, a very viable uh, way to make any kind of money and preserve your purchasing power. So what I plan on doing for these kind of things is as we get closer to the um, halving uh, in April, which is supposed to be somewhere around the end of April, um, it coincides nicely with this, what I was talking about a little bit earlier, the reverse repo market coming down. As that comes down, I want to get out of our fixed income investments. So if we have, say, in our separately managed accounts, we have a 30% allocation to those right now, generating this nearly 8% um, return. I'm going to bring that down, move that to cash, expecting that we're going to have some sort of turmoil in the first or second quarter. We already have sizable positions in our Bitcoin proxies, but I will use that extra cash at that point to then shift over into Bitcoin. As we get into the halving and past the halving, uh, we want to really be uh, heavily allocated to that. So what I'll do then as a fund manager and as a, you know, a, um, investment advisor is writing to my client. So I've already started dropping hints like, Hey, just so you know, we've increased our Bitcoin positions already as we get to the halving and past it, so probably summertime uh, of 2024, we're gonna really wanna get heavily invested in Bitcoin. So kind of mentally prepare yourself for, we're gonna, we're gonna start dealing with volatility. It will be worth it though, because then we're getting to the kind of exciting part of like the last basically 12 to 18 months of the Bitcoin bull market. It may not happen, right? Past performance is not indicative of future returns. Those kind of things, I have to have all those disclaimers all the time, but based on past cycles uh, and, and, and intuition and kind of looking at macro and the fact that I think that the central banks are gonna be forced to step in and start doing quantitative easing again, I think it's setting up to be a really nice, you know, bull market coming in Bitcoin. So that's how I think about it. So we're going to phase out of fixed income. We're going to actually bring down our uh, other equities uh, that we have as well. I have like 20 different stocks and ETFs that we hold. And so I, I sort of... Uh, orderly bring those positions down a bit and I'll funnel that uh, money over into Bitcoin and then we'll hopefully be ready for the next Bitcoin bull market if it comes. Right on. So then, and this is not just a Bitcoin only question, but I'll, I'll use Bitcoin as an example. What kind of news do you care about? And does the news or developments like if Russia came out and officially said, we're mining Bitcoin and we're putting it on, you know, uh, using it as reserve, uh, would that move the price of Bitcoin in the short term? And do you react to these kinds of things? So I don't put a lot of stock into almost any news. The only, so the, what do I care about? I care about what is liquidity doing because liquidity does move Bitcoin price over the long run. It, I call it the great absorber of liquidity. So when liquidity is contracting, as we've seen for the last 12 years is Bitcoin contracts when liquidity contracts and when Bitcoin is, and when liquidity is expanding, so does the price of Bitcoin. So I, I pay very careful attention to that news for the most part. I don't care at all about other than to make maybe a short term trade. <clears throat> so, so say somebody came out and, and, you know, the sec said, we're suing Bitcoin and we're going to, you know, some stupid thing like that. We're, we're going to come after something or, or, you know, a, a realistic thing. They shut down uh, FTX, right, and went after Sam Bankman fraud. Um, that obviously had a, a, a negative effect on Bitcoin. That can drop the price down lower than it probably would normally be just if, if there was no news on that day. I'll take advantage of those kind of opportunities. And if we have cash sitting on the sidelines and I know that I want to increase our positions, then yeah, I'll take advantage of that and purchase. So right now, for example, the price of Bitcoin is sitting at about 37.5. If some negative news came out and the price dropped, I would love for it personally to drop down to say 30,000 or even as low as, I think it'd go down to 23 to 25,000 right now if, if everything just was uh, terrible right now. I would love that because then what I would do is get into this where I was talking about, I, I, you know, I, I tell my clients we're gonna shift into larger positions if the opportunity arises just some random Wednesday, 
then I'm going to take advantage of that. And we're going to shift into that a little bit earlier than anticipated. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it, almost like a, you know, a value investor looking for deep values like, or like a stink bid kind of concept. Um, if it happens to dump low, we're going to place a stink bid and hopefully get a ton of it for super cheap because I know where I think it's going to go on the long run uh, and, and, and how we want to be allocated. So yes, I listen to the news, but only for those kind of events. I think for the most part, news is a non-event. Um, the only news that I think that was truly significant over the last few years was when China banned miners back in 2021. I think that that actually cut that bull market short. I really believe that Bitcoin was going up to over 100K, like probably 125,000 or so. But that was a serious, true hit to Bitcoin. You know, suddenly the hash rate dropped in half. That's a big deal. You know, Bitcoin didn't flinch. It kept performing, you know, perfectly. And the security was fine. Everything was fine. But that was a real legitimate hit. And I think that that big hit took the price down. It took the momentum out of the bull market. It tried to come back. It did that second rally and got up to 69K or so. But that sort of ruined the party. And so that kind of news, I'll definitely pay attention to because that has an effect. But otherwise, I think most other news is just sort of, um, you know, baseless. And it's just kind of wind. It's, it's noise. Not, not true signal. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, side tangent, I mean, considering where the hash rate is now and where the hash rate is, is even in China, I wonder what the point of that was. And I still think it might have been calculated and coordinated to dampen the, the whole sector. But that's neither here nor there at the moment. So uh, I love how there seems to be a certain, uh, you, you know, you, uh, I've noted you you know the treasury uh, markets right away by glancing at your screen, you know, the Bitcoin price, what are the kind of things that would you have on your screen that you could glance at constantly throughout the day? And why would you care where they are every 10 minutes or every hour? Sure. So yeah, other things that I watch, so I watch and I have it all up on my screen right here. So I watch what volatility is doing. I watch what the dollar is doing. The dollar moves the markets for sure. So when the dollar is strengthening, that's just tough for risk assets all across the board, including Bitcoin in general. When the dollar is falling, uh, that tends to be good for risk assets. I'll pay attention to that. I actually watch the price of oil pretty closely. Uh, oil is a good monitor for what the world economy is doing. It's like it, it's what lubricates and powers the growth engine uh, of the world's economy. When oil is falling, like it has been, it got up to about $90 per barrel. And now it's sitting at about, it had a nice little rally recently, but it's still sitting at about $77, $78 per barrel. That suggests to me that the economy is still hanging in there, but we're not too far from uh, this recession possibly kicking in. I don't normally care about recession, right? Investing is different from what the economy itself is doing. But if you have a bad enough recession, that can pull down the markets with it. Uh, and so I do keep an eye on that. If, if energy, if oil suddenly uh, tanks, uh, there's a couple things that would happen. So if you have the combination of oil tanking, if you have um, unemployment, shooting higher. And I keep an eye on that. Uh, and if you have the high yield, it's called the OAS option adjusted spread. Um, that's widening. That may, basically means the yield on junk bonds uh, against the underlying treasury. So the risk-free rate. Um, if that if that gap is widening, that means people are getting more and more scared and they're piling into treasuries and getting out of these high yield bonds. Those three things, especially taken together, signal that we're, that we're heading into a recession. Uh, if that happens, I would get kind of, uh, my, you know, my little antennae would go up, my spidey signal would go on, and I would be concerned that we're going to take a major dump and it's going to happen pretty quickly. Uh, so, you know, and, and like we talked about, that can affect bond, the bond market. Stocks can dump, especially these, you know, all of these tech stocks and growth stocks and kind of things. And then Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin, I consider it to be the world's safest asset, uh, it's still because of its liquidity features. If people get margin called, especially on Wall Street, if they get margin called for a billion dollars and they have a ton of their uh, investments in non-liquid stuff like real estate, they're going to they're gonna take their liquidity from wherever they can. And if that means they have to sell their Bitcoin position, they'll do it. And that can dump the price 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% uh, like that. And so I keep an eye on those kind of things. Yeah, people can't sell their house uh, 24 seven and, and extract exactly. that that equity and that liquidity. So, yeah. Uh, so why does Bitcoin act as a canary in the coal mine? I think because it's the world's freest market. So, um, you know, it, it just like it did in the fourth quarter of 2021, I, even though every everyone, including me, was super excited that it was going to continue to go higher and maybe hit 100K. 
it just sends trouble underneath the economic hood. And I started talking about that. And I think January of 2022, I was like, it just knows something is wrong with the system. It can tell there's problems in the economy. And I think mostly what it can sense is that liquidity had peaked and was rolling over as well. And so Bitcoin senses that. Um, all markets look ahead. It depends what kind of asset classes we're talking about. Real estate tends to lag. Bitcoin and smaller caps and tech stocks tend to look ahead uh, six to 12 months or so. And so because it's such a perfectly free market, uh, it just sees things sooner. Uh, people are, you know, they want to know that they have liquidity supporting it and they have an underlying economy that's supporting their movements. And then they can move further out on the risk spectrum. Again, even though Bitcoin, I consider it the world's safest asset, the market, the majority of market participants still consider it to be a risk asset. So they think of it farther out on the risk curve. Mm -hmm. assets like that. And then there's, you know, crypto nonsense that's even further out there. Uh, and so when people get that speculative frenzy and they feel like they have the economy supporting them and they have liquidity supporting them, they'll go way out there and, and, and you know, shoot for these, uh, you know, 500% or 1000% gains. Right. And what, what I'm also want to build on there is, and I think what happens with Bitcoin being a canary in the coal mine is that's sort of like a gradual thing where it starts to kind of act up a little uh, in a preceding fashion. Uh, but not, you know, it's not like we're talking about, you know, a 10K candle is the canary in the coal mine or a 100K candle or, you know, a 50% move per se. Uh, those kind of can happen randomly up or down. And they also could be very in sync with like major markets like we saw in March of 2020. So uh, and I was talking about this with James Lavish and, and it's been creeping up in a lot of my conversations. But I, I want to know what what is going to what it just seems like all the warning lights are not real anymore. It seems like, you know, you're at a console like you are now and you got multiple screens and what normally would have been uh, a really big warning light, like what happened in the Treasury markets a week or two ago or um, what's happening with, uh, you know, the Fed raising rates faster than they have ever, uh, you know, at a very high rate, even though we haven't gotten to highest rates ever. Uh, none of these things are really kind of sending, I, I feel like, everyone's screaming and running for the hills. And uh, I'm getting the feeling that we're that we're going to get a lot of these sort of crazy red light warnings that are going to be irrelevant until warnings that are, can't even be imagined now. I, I, I I'm kind of wondering, and I, I wonder what the value is like. Looking at all these, uh, you, you know, we have all these uh, the Bitcoin price and the Treasury markets, and you were mentioning some of these other ratios and, and metrics you're looking at, and like maybe uh, I could just give Dr. Jeff Ross a summary at the end of each day, uh, you know, and and. The intraday doesn't matter. I just don't know what to look for anymore. It's like a glaring um, canary, you know, in a very like sort of um, in the moment, not over months. Do you think, what do you think about the economy right now and sort of the lights that we see percolating versus what we might see? Yeah, well, I think I think you're hitting the nail on the head that I've seen a across the board with economists that are just frustrated and kind of confused about what to do. Um, because the signals are telling you different things. And I think it gets back to what we talked about earlier is what lots of us didn't factor in is that the, the fiscal response from the government, that they were just going to pour money into the economy sort of behind the scenes and, and have these $2 trillion deficits. People didn't even think that was possible. Like, how could you possibly do that if we're not in a recession and we're not at war? But here we are, just these massive, massive deficits. To me, it's clearly because of where we are in the presidential election cycle. They want to get elected again, and the Democrats know. And I'm not political, by the way, so don't hate me. But but so, you know, the people who are in charge, they want to get reelected again, and they want the economy to be as strong as possible. You know, the president is out there, you know, bragging about how great the economy is right now because they're just pouring in crazy amounts of money right now. And so it's throwing off all of these signals. And instead of having this big, huge um, uh, collapse in the economy, what we should have, we're having more of this rolling recession. We've been in a recession, you know, depending on what term you want to use, we've been in a contraction which is the same thing as a recession in manufacturing in the U.S. for a year already, uh, and that is has been lagging and been and people have been suffering and people have been uh, get, losing their jobs, um, both in the U.S. and around the world for over a year. But the services sector has been hanging in there. It's been hanging into mildly expansionary mode. And because the U.S. is such a strong services based economy, we're about 70, 30 services to manufacturing. The services have been just strong enough to sort of keep the whole economy afloat and from not sinking down into this contraction and sinking further into a recession. 
Um, and so that's just throwing people off. And so you can listen to people that will tell you all the reasons, right? Like credit is drying up. We're in this credit crunch. Senior loan officers are saying, you know what, we're not, we're, we're just not putting loans out there. People are trying to get loans and they can't get loans, even if, we, if they have great credit scores, those kind of things. So that means that monetary, M, you know, M2 money supply is not increasing. It's actually been deflating uh, over the last several months because of that, because banks aren't making loans. We're not creating new money. Uh, we're not creating new loans. And, and people who do have loans, lots of them are going belly up. So they're going bankrupt. They can't pay their loans. That actually destroys monetary supply as well. It's hard on the economy. We have all of these mixed signals. And so I, it's funny because I was very convinced in at the end of 22 that we were headed into a recession in early 2023 sometime. And then I kept being wrong and being wrong and being wrong. I'm to the point now when I look at what the what the government is doing with their fiscal response, and then I see kind of the the you know you know what the credit crunch is doing, and I look at how manufacturing has been lagging, but it looks like it may be possibly turning up finally. And I look at the senior loan officer reports and and credit uh, you know contraction, how it's been. They've just been not they've been getting tighter and tighter and not handing out loans. That's rolling over as well. There's a chance that we actually get through this without having a major recession, without an un, uh, unemployment rates going that much higher. I, I think it's, and this is a terrible response because people always want to know the answer. I'm about a third, third, and third. I think there's a third of a chance we go into a horrible, terrible recession and we have like almost a depression like 1929 moment where stocks drop 80%. I could see that happening in 2024. I could also see that we have this sort of soft recession, this kind of rolling type recession where maybe services starts to dip a little bit. Manufacturing doesn't pull out quite fast enough. The government doesn't do this fiscal stimulus quite as much as they said they're going to do. Um, and then the reverse repo market runs out and we have a bit of a you know chaotic time while we try to figure out who's going to absorb these new treasuries. And we have sort of a soft recession, and that would be similar to sort of 2000 to 2003, where tech stocks just kind of kept going lower and lower and lower over those three years, but the economy didn't get hit very hard. I could see that for sure. I could also see that we're done. I could see maybe 2022 was the worst of it, and we're actually going to pull out of this, and all this fiscal response is coming at just the right time. And then suddenly we're going to realize we're going to look back and be like, dang, we're already through the worst of it. And Bitcoin's just going to keep you know, going higher, and tech stocks are going to just keep getting more and more overvalued. And we're going to be like, well, I guess that was it. And now we're back on the new business cycle and everything is starting to accelerate again. Uh, and liquidity is be and we're already seeing we liquidity bottomed all the way back in the fourth quarter of 2022. So over a year ago, and it has been creeping higher since then. So for over a year, maybe that just continues and maybe everything just gets kind of peachy and rosy. And we're just like, well, what happened to that recession? If that happens, I think then that's just setting the stage for the peak of the next business cycle, maybe towards the end of 2025, and then just having an absolute disaster. Maybe that's when we have our 1929 moment and stocks get destroyed and Bitcoin falls 80% again. It's so hard to predict. And again, it's because of all of this centrally controlled central planning that's going on where we just don't know what the Fed is going to do and we don't know what Congress is going to do. And, and how much fiscal stimulus they're going to continue to do. So it makes it extremely, extremely difficult. And, and, I can, and you can point out people who are on all of these different sides of the spectrum from the optimists to the, to the, um, you know, the soft landings to the, the world is, is going down and it's going to be the worst, um, the worst thing ever since the Great Depression. There are people who truly believe that and they think we're right on the precipice. And all of those situations are plausible. So where do I stand? It doesn't really matter where I stand. I'm just, you know, I continue to watch what liquidity is doing. And I continue to watch what Bitcoin is doing. And I think the, the purest signal in all of the markets is what is Bitcoin doing. Uh, and, I'll, and, and I'll just continue to follow that. Well, I agree with so much you said there. Uh, I will say, I mean, I, I, I hate both political parties, so I, I don't want to get political either. Mm -hmm. um, but this reminds me just very much of uh, 2008, the great financial crisis. And I just remember TARP. And TARP felt like one of those inflection points, like long-term capital management, like October and 87 Black Monday, where a decision had to be made and we were going to either bail out or not bail out, but a decision had to be made and we were at a precipice. We were staring over a cliff. And that decision, I think, was around $750 billion, which sounds like nothing now. And uh, I think we bounced back pretty well from that. Uh, I think even that program ended up being profitable uh, for the government. And we papered over it. And I, I and uh, a lot of me thinks that what we faced in March of 2020 was that moment again. And that we've gone through it. So, 
But emotionally, 99% of me emotionally uh, thinks we're headed for Great Depression 2.0 and it's going to be worse. But I, I, I put that in sort of the, lo the logical part of my brain at 1%. And that's why I keep quizzing people because I'm like, does anyone feel this way? <laughs> and, and I keep looking at sort of, um, you know, the auto uh, loan delinquency and credit cards and mortgages and and I'm looking at prices and, and just vectors. You, know, you think about the notion of, uh, you know, an 8% interest rate on a $100,000 mortgage. And if it goes up to 10%, we're not talking a lot of money on someone's uh, $33,000 salary. Nowadays, people are making forty thousand, and you're talking about going maybe from you know five, uh, three percent to let's say we get up to twelve percent on a four hundred thousand dollar home or a three hundred thousand dollar home, and they're not making much more, and that's way more material. It's the same ratio, but proportionally, and I, it just seems like things are going to break. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if the government passed an eight trillion dollar bill tomorrow, and that bought us six more years of whatever we had from two thousand nine to two thousand fifteen, whatever yeah. you want to call that, right? And and you remember right front front so after TARP, so, so first of all to your point, I think it was the global financial crisis. That's where central banks wrested control of the markets from the underlying economy. They basically took it over and said, "We got it from here. It's now going to be dependent on how much liquidity we inject into the system." That's what I think happened. And since then, it's been harder and harder to read the underlying market signals. If you remember 2010, 2011, 2012. We all thought the world was going to end still at that time, right? I mean, we're just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Inflation is going to spike. They're putting so much money into it. This is insane. Stocks are going to crash. Everything's terrible. But and I, I built that was pre veil share for me, but I was watching the markets closely at that time. I remember the fear. Nobody believed the market rally. We all thought it was actually going to get worse and we were going to go below those 2000, those March 2009 lows. And it didn't. It just kind of kept creeping higher and higher. And so I agree with you that. It's possible that the, the GFC was actually kind of the equivalent of the 1929 crash. And we've been living through this depression for 15 years, and it's just been papered over by central bank debasement. And they just keep pouring money and pouring money and pouring money. And anytime something goes bad, they just set up a new four letter fund for banks that are troubled, for whoever's troubled. You know, I think the next thing that's troubled is commercial real estate. Everybody knows that that's rolling over and it's in huge trouble. I think the Fed's going to start buying debt from commercial real estate and they're going to create a new four letter program and commercial real estate people who are in trouble and regional banks that have a lot of commercial real estate on their balance sheet. They're going to be like, here's another thing you can, you can, uh, we'll support you and you can kick the can down the road for another one, two or three years. And we'll say it's temporary, but it's actually forever. Uh, and you can use this program and we're just going to continue doing that. And, and we might just float through this again. And even though nobody believes it, Maybe we might already be through the worst of it. Um, so I'm with you. It's it's very difficult to read the signs because there's so much manipulation happening. It's just not a free market. Yeah, I don't envy you and your job. Um, <laughs> it's tough. I just want to batten down the hatches and, and buy things I never want to trade or think about ever getting out of. Um, there's not many I could put in that bucket besides right. Bitcoin. Um, what do you think the future uh, Bitcoin cycles look like? You know, let's say, and I'm not of this mind. I, you know, I, I, I want to keep in mind that Bitcoin could be down in price from five years from now, or even in price, or not up much more. It's a possibility. I don't know what's going to happen, but what do you think of? You know, let's say we did have this sort of uh, upward trajectory going into the having, post having, and the future of Bitcoin cycles. So I am so into liquidity and the fact that that moves markets above sort of all else that I erroneously said about two years ago, I was kind of on this little rampage for a little while that I said the four-year cycles are dead. It's all about liquidity. That's the only thing that matters. I don't believe that anymore, though. I think there's actually is a, a, a magic, not even a, a magic, but sort of a, a, a systematic certainty to the four-year cycle uh, that I didn't believe before, but I really truly believe is a legitimate thing. And the having is not magical, but it has that sort of sort of mystical property because what happens is as you approach, and I know you know this, but as we, as we approach the having, we have ton, we have a set demand for all of the new Bitcoin that comes into play. And for me, it was a, a paradigm shift in how I thought about it. I had always previously thought about Bitcoin as there's always only ever 21 million. That's all that matters. 
But that's not what matters. What matters is, is what's on the margin because the price of Bitcoin is set at the margin. So basically the available supply of Bitcoin and it's small and getting smaller because of all of us crazy hodlers that just stack sats, put it into cold storage and forget about it. That, that supply that is available on the market is ever shrinking. Uh, and that's obviously good for price in the long run get, if demand continues to stay the same. If demand stays the same and we get to the halving point, then suddenly as of that day, there's half the amount of new Bitcoin coming onto the market. So the miners who, who uh, you know, they, they create this new Bitcoin, they collect it, they can either keep it or they can put it on the market as well. Lots of miners tend to sell it, uh, especially around that time because they're barely making it because the hash rate is so high. There's so much competition. There are miners right now that are really, really struggling. Some, some miners are not going to make it past the next six to nine months, I think, um, unless the price goes much higher. So, so you have that stable demand and now half of the available supply that's coming under the market daily, uh, that just supply and demand, that's all it is. And you can't make more Bitcoin. And so, so basically what has to happen, everybody knows supply demand curves from, from economics 101, the price has to go higher. Uh, and so that happens. I think it's going to continue to happen in perpetuity, but well, at least until 2140 or 2139, whenever the last Bitcoin is, is mined, will be long gone by then. Um, but I think for our lifetimes, I think the Bitcoin cycles will have, um, uh, a dramatic effect. I also think that Bitcoin is powerful enough that it's going to um, overwhelm the world's economic cycles and dictate the world's economic cycles. So I think they are going to fall in line. A lot of people say, well, it's weird how it follows the presidential cycle. And it's weird how it follows the liquidity cycles around the world. And it's weird how it follows the business cycles. And chicken or the egg, what came first? Why is that happening? I think over time, because of Bitcoin's nature and because it's unchanging, uh, uh, I think that it's going to basically set the policy for worldwide economic cycles in perpetuity, at least for the rest of our lifetime. So I'm a big believer in it. I think it holds. It's why I'm as bullish as I am right now. It's because I think, you know, we got through the, the, the bear market in 2022 that ended in like November, December of 2022. I became crabbish, like sideways crabbish at that point. Liquidity started to return. Bitcoin bounced. It's up about whatever, 125% or so uh, since its lows. And then I think heading into the next bull market where we're, we're heading after the halving, I think things are going to be very exciting. And then touching base to where we were before back in 2021, that was a disappointing bull market. And I think most people were a bit kind of scratching their heads as to why. I think it's because China banned the miners. And I think that was a real, uh, you know, huge punch to the system. And I think that cut that bull market short. I think because of that, there are a lot of people who are underestimating where we're going to go. They think of it kind of as rolling over and they just don't see, uh, you know, significant new highs coming. Maybe it hits 100,000, a lot of people are saying. I think it continues on and goes back to sort of its, its earlier uh, bull markets. And we see much higher highs in the next cycle based on demand, based on limited supply, uh, and just based on kind of where Bitcoin is sort of, uh, I hate to say programmed, but it kind of is programmed to go over time as the population, um, as, as more and more of the population picks it up as it grows on the S curve. Um, I, I just think it's going to be a pretty exciting story for the rest of our lifetime. I, I agree. I think the most exciting thing about Bitcoin is it constantly proves me wrong. All my assumptions coming into Bitcoin and even my assumptions about Bitcoin uh, I, I can only sort of um, trust Bitcoin to do what it always does, TikTok next block. But, you know, sort of thinking about these things, um, I, I, you know, I, I remember summer of 2019 pre having it, it did. It went on a pretty big run from like around 3,800 to about 14,000 uh, pre having. And then it went back down. I mean, at least by March 20 from 10,000 all the way down to like around 4,000. Um, I, I do think. Uh, volatility will only go up from here is kind of my my intuition i'm kind of wrong about these things but i do think volatility goes up i think about in terms of uh you know i i say it a bit but at one million dollars bitcoin we were talking about one cent a sat and it looks like a shit coin at that point and most people would pay two cents a sat easy i could flip to you know go over a million on the overnight but i also think about etf pricing so you know very similar to gbtc you know you can log in and get a share right now for around 29 dollars uh, there's nothing preventing any of these companies to pricing them at, you know, a dollar a share or ten dollars a share. And, and that, again, is like if you're going to pay a dollar a share, whatever that equivocates into Bitcoin, why wouldn't you pay two dollars a share for that if you don't understand the underlying asset and you want to get in and, and move your capital and allocate? So it'll, it'll be interesting on that front. 
But I, I want to ask you, when do you think Bitcoin starts to act like a risk off asset? So you do have people uh, mentioning, you know, sort of fl flight of quality, flight to quality or flight to stability. Um, for me, you know, and I think for a lot of Bitcoiners, it's always been sort of that stable uh, risk off asset. But when do you think it starts acting like that in the greater marketplace? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I do. I think when it has parity to gold's market cap, so when that's around 10 to 12 trillion or so right now, I think when Bitcoin gets to that point, people are going to start thinking of it. First of all, we're, you know, the narrative up into that point is going to be, oh, it's like digital gold and it's kind of easy for people to understand. And then it's going to go past that and we're not going to talk about it being digital gold anymore because we're going to talk about all the ways it's superior to gold and why would we compare it to gold? That's silly. Um, hmm. But I think that's to the point where people will basically start taking it seriously. And I think the volatility will continue to shrink at that point. I think that the CAGR, so the compounded annual uh, you know, growth rate of Bitcoin is going to just kind of real slowly decrease over time, but it's still going to be um, pretty impressive for our lifetimes. So like I think of a CAGR right now for the, for the rest of the 2020s for Bitcoin, I think a reasonable CAGR is about 40 to 45% from current prices. That's really good. I mean, if you could get that in stocks or bonds or Anything. real estate, or you would be just, you know, falling off your, you know, your chair, you'd be so happy. Um, that I think that's actually reasonable and not that high for Bitcoin. I think that's um, I think a lot of people have too high expectations for it because when it rips higher, they tend to compare Kagers, you know, like when it's at its peak. So I think the next peak in 2025, this is just my guess, but I think it's going to go to about, say, 475,000 or so. People are going to be talking about these amazing, you know, 200 percent Kagers when it's at these peaks. And I just don't think that's the best way to think about it. And maybe it's because I come from sort of a value investing background that I want to think like, when is it deeply valued? Valued, what is its sort of basal rate of growth? Uh, and to me, that's what the basal rate of growth is through the 2020s is about that 40 to 45%. When we get into 2030s, I think it drops to 30 to 35%, 40, 2040s, you know, and then we're 25s. And by the time we're, you know, we're old, we're old dudes sitting around and we're going to be telling our kids about how amazing the growth was when we were kids. But I think then it will be more of like a 10%, 5%, you know, the excitement will sort of be gone. But I do think it grows in perpetuity. I agree with Michael Saylor that it's going up forever just because of its dynamic and its per it dynamics and its perfect scarcity. Uh, I just think that's sort of built into the system. But um, these early days are the fun days for sure. And so that is that is the expectation that I have when I see it get sort of near the bottom when we have these, you know, big bear markets and it kind of hits these just ridiculously low levels. That's the time you want to just just jump into it and not really worry about what's going to happen because even if it underperforms from a historical perspective, even if we don't have those parabolic rises higher, I still think if you can count on a forty to fifty percent or so kegger, you're going to be doing really well and you're going to be doing much better than any other asset class that you could invest in. Yeah, I mean those numbers are thrilling. Um, I think that they sound awesome. I I, I think that. Um... The only way I think they may underestimate things is they I don't know if they incorporate or bake in the the synergies of having the world on one money and the productivity growth that comes from that just being baked into humans that that money would capture and Bitcoin being the world's reserve currency would capture the increase in human productivity from going on the Bitcoin standard, which I think could juice those results the way I think a lot of people are hoping AI will juice results uh, mm -hmm. in the coming years. So what do you think? is the likelihood of getting a uh, a bitcoin spot bitcoin etf in in the near term i'm sort of um i think we're getting teased here i think the market's getting teased to be honest and i could see you know some negative news coming out in the market dumping 10 20 30 percent on that news and none of this matters long term but I, I think because of what we're seeing with gbtc and then the related entities i i could see you know holding off on an etf i don't think the legacy markets are any rush to give us a spot bitcoin etf and us is not the right word to give the market or retail right that and i also think it could be sort of a, a buy the news uh sell the event type thing like so you know the run-up is better than the actual event and mm -hmm. and, and then mm -hmm. i'm kind of curious so you, you know the intrigue around uh you know gbtc and whether blackrock is gonna get that whole bag and use that to seed their etf so do you think an ETF is likely in the short term? Does this matter to you? Is this something your clients would be excited about, like knowing that that's what, how the market's rewarding Bitcoin with that sort of uh, traditional investment vehicle? Yeah, so lots of good questions there. Lots of different roads to take. So um, 
I, I thought there was a chance it could have happened. There was this little window where the SEC could have basically blanket approved all of the applications. And we actually just got past that. It would have been last week uh, where they could have done that. And so we're past that window now. So because of that, I think it's really unlikely that they will give any kind of approval this year. Uh, I think it's most likely to happen in Q1 of uh, 2024. Um, and just and and just to be clear, approval initial approval from the SEC doesn't mean that they start trading right away. They still have to go through some steps uh, and get different documents approved. And then there's like a 75 day window from approval until the ETF can actually start trading. And so to your point, I think it would be that would be a great example of a buy the rumor, sell the news kind of event where once it gets approved, I think Bitcoin price goes wild. We might see a 10,000, you know, the, the, the so-called God candle uh, happen. We could see it spike up $10,000 within five minutes or, or half an hour or something. It would be crazy. And then as it gets up to that 75, which is about two and a half months later, so two and a half months later, once it finally uh, starts trading, we might actually see a decrease in price and kind of disappointment. The way I look at it, again, coming back to the four-year cycles, I have a, a having price target based on past cycles of forty to forty-five thousand dollars on having day. So what it's like April twenty-sixth or whatever the day is. Um, if it rips way higher than that before having day because of an ETF approval, I I would instead of being overly excited that it's going to the moon, I would be nervous that we've gone too far too fast uh, because of how these cycles work, which is kind of uncanny. And I would expect it to pull back significantly uh, at that point. Uh, and likewise, if it's way underneath that, say the SEC doesn't approve it and you know, and they're going after Binance still and they're going after Kraken and all these other exchanges and it's just bad news, bad news, bad news. There's a chance we're under that price and I would think, okay, it's too cheap right now. It needs to kind of catch up to where it should be. Um, that's, that's how I view it. You were talking about, well, it, like, will my clients be excited? I'm more excited about micro strategy than I am about any of the ETFs. And I'll tell you why for, for a couple of reasons. One is the ETFs have a management fee and micro strategy has no management fee. Two is I would argue that Michael Saylor is the greatest ETF manager in the history of ETF managers, especially for Bitcoin, right? Nobody understands Bitcoin like he does. Nobody has his conviction. He not only buys it and keeps it on his balance sheet, but he borrows money uh, at, at great rates. He's, he's way smarter than most market participants. So he gets super dirt cheap uh, debt and buys more Bitcoin. So it's like a leveraged way to play Bitcoin. He, when his micro strategy shares get too expensive, relative to underlying Bitcoin, then he, he creates more shares, gets more cash in, buys more Bitcoin. He is, he's like the, and I, I said this in a tweet like a, a month ago or so, it kind of offended some people, but I think he's like the Warren Buffett of Bitcoin. The, and I'm talking about old school Warren Buffett. So back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, when he was just this stud, you know, hedge fund manager turned Berkshire Hathaway dude, he knows when to sell shares. He knows when to buy things cheap. He knows how to get, you know, 50% you know, Kager kind of uh, returns in the old fiat market. I think that's how Sailor is. He's super smart. He's smarter than almost anybody he's sitting across the desk from. He's fully all into Bitcoin. He's a billionaire and literally doesn't care, right? He's never going to sell his Bitcoin. In fact, I think he's said this before and I believe him. He's going to die and not tell anybody his keys, his seed phrase, and he's taken Bitcoin with him. And that's going to be his donation to the world. And he believes that like he's going to be like seen as the ultimate philanthropist, second only to Satoshi Nakamoto. So you can have him running your ETF or you can have BlackRock who's just, you know, they don't really get it, but they, you know, they just want to get in on the game and make some money or ARK or whoever, you know, choose, choose your, your people fidelity. And I'm not hating on them. And that's an okay thing for other people to do. But if you must buy some sort of fund in a brokerage account, I still think micro strategy is the best way to go. Uh, and then and then I just feel like this needs to be said because we're on a Bitcoin show. It's way better for Bitcoiners to simply buy real Bitcoin and take it off exchanges and put it into cold storage. You shouldn't be buying ETFs, uh, I don't think. You can do what you want, right? It's it's a free country. Um, but the whole point of Bitcoin is it's permissionless. You can be your own bank, it's decentralized. You can send it wherever you wanna send it. If you have it in an ETF, it's not permissionless. It's, it's, you know, it's an IOU, it's not real Bitcoin. So just be cognizant of the risks that come from owning an ETF relative to owning Bitcoin itself. Sure. Yeah, the, I, I like what you said there, and I, I like the micro strategy play as well. It's very interesting. Um, from Base Bitcoiner on Twitter, he wanted to know what your thoughts, uh, you know, around FASB and the accounting changes coming up. 
I'm no accountant, uh, but from what I listened to what Sailor about it is this is a big deal for some people, right? They, they don't like the way that Bitcoin has been treated. It's these goofy old school rules. Uh, and, I, and I shouldn't even be talking about it because I'm not an accountant. But basically, it only hurts businesses to have Bitcoin on their balance sheet based on current rules because the, the lowest the Bitcoin price goes during a quarter, that's how they have to record it. People don't want to see that. It makes their company look bad. It makes their quarterly earnings look bad. Um, sailors is like, I don't care. We're still going to own it anyways, uh, obviously. And he's the first, he's got first mover advantage because of that. Um, but he believes, and I agree with him, that when the, the FASB rules change and they treat Bitcoin like it should be treated and, it, and it's, it's, it's basically held on the books as its fair value, and the actual current value of it, um, that will be very meaningful. So I think that will have a meaningful impact. I think a lot more companies will start coming on board. Personally, just for the, just so people know, I think it's inevitable that at some point the entire world moves on to a Bitcoin standard. So I think that all companies, you know, we're, right now MicroStrategy is early. There's Block, there's Tesla that owns some. There's a few other countries that own some. A lot of the miners hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Someday all of them will have them. And so you can be a latecomer or you can be an early adopter and the early adopters are obviously going to benefit much more. Um, so um, it's inevitable. Uh, all of this stuff is inevitable. Even like, you know, talking about governments owning it, you know, the Malay just won. That's fantastic. He's a kind of pro Bitcoin dude. I, you know, I, I have tempered expectations that it's going to do anything major for Bitcoin. Um, but I think it's inevitable that all countries eventually are going to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet uh, because it's just superior money. And that's just what happens over time. So I don't know if it happens in five years or it happens in 50 years, but somewhere along the way, hopefully before I die, we're going to see all people, all businesses in all countries having some Bitcoin, uh, you know, on their balance sheet. Yeah, he kind of goes on to, you know, he wants to know, you know, if you think currency wars will lead to a Bitcoin standard. And I, I think you kind of answered that there. So I'm going to move on to uh, Breedom for Freedom wanted to know, what is the absolute wildest tail event, low probability outlandish outcome that you can't get out of your mind? From a negative or positive perspective? Let's go negative. Negative. Um, I went through all of that like four or five years ago, 2018, 2019, where I thought of what are how are what are all of the ways I could be wrong about Bitcoin? And my main thing then was that government just hates it so much they're gonna the US government will attack it and shut it down. And if not the US, then China will. And after a while, I thought that's just never gonna happen. There's no reason why they would do it. While Bitcoin is small, it just is insignificant and they don't care about it. And at some point it's just gonna get to be too big. And I think it's already reached that point where they can't do anything about it. And what would it benefit them to do? Like, are they really going to spend billions and billions of dollars and somehow have this master plan, you know, to, to get into all these servers and do a 51% attack on Bitcoin? There's, it, it's just ridiculous that they would do that because we, you know, the Bitcoin would just fork off and then we'd realize these are the naughty people over here and Bitcoin would continue on. And it would be a, a, a you know, a short-term blow to the system, but it's not going to hurt it in the, the, um, the longer term. So I, you know, people talk about, well, what about um, quantum computing? There's people who are a billion times smarter than me that have thought a lot about this already that they know, okay, if we get to that point where quantum computing is sort of the norm, we can do things and change the code so that they can't crack everybody's code and steal everybody's Bitcoin. All of those kind of thing, I sort of have gone through like every single thing I can think of. And to me, nothing makes sense. The only thing See, and, and nothing is reasonable because I say, well, what if government suddenly got, you know, they, they, they got religion and they suddenly practiced austerity and the dollar became a really sound currency like the Swiss franc used to be? That would slow adoption of Bitcoin a little bit, but there's no way that's going to happen. We're going to go into this debt spiral for sure, and we're going to see inflation getting worse and worse and worse, uh, you know, and go into this death spiral eventually. I just don't, I, I've gone through every thing in my mind and I can't come up with any reason that it's going to fail. I think I do think, and I hate to say this because it makes people mad because I know it still takes human uh, action and we still have to try hard, but I think it's inevitable. I just don't think you can stop it. It's like saying like, you know, shutting off, stopping Bitcoin is like stopping the internet. You just don't stop it. You don't go kick out the plug or turn it off or, you know, it's too decentralized. It You, you, you just can't win. Um, and so outside of a meteor destroying the entire world uh, or a nuclear war that, you know, destroys everything at that point, we won't care about anything other than survival for those people who are left. So it's a moot point. So anyways, that's that tele event. 
on the upside yeah. is hyper Bitcoinization, right? And so basically we have that S shaped curve that people watch instead of having that slow move higher, that's not too slow, it's still pretty fast. But if it goes like this and suddenly goes exponential higher and all of the world's currencies and all of the purchasing power heads into Bitcoin faster than we expect, that's the upside. And so that's the downside if people take profits in Bitcoin. And that's the thing you got to be careful for, because you might think that you hit a peak, like say we get to my target of this of 2025 in the fourth quarter of um, 475,000, you know, it'll be tempting to take profits, quote unquote. But what are you taking profits into? Are you mm -hmm. going to literally sit in cash? and hope that we have a huge pullback where it goes down to, you know, I think it could go down to 70 to hundred K it could, and it should based on, I think what, you know, past cycles, but what if we have hyper Bitcoinization and suddenly the U S says, you know what, we're going to back our currency with Bitcoin and suddenly all the world follows it. And then it just takes off and, and you never see these cheap prices of 475 K again. So that's the upside is that it just goes so ridiculously fast and the world's purchasing power pours into it. Um, it's happening. It's it's happening slowly right now. We're seeing it in countries. We're seeing it in El Salvador. Argentina could be the next. Max Kaiser says he think he can think of three more countries in either Central or South America that may uh, you know introduce a Bitcoin standard or make it legal tender in the next uh, quarter. It could happen sooner than you think. So you gotta you gotta you gotta um, think about opportunity costs of not owning Bitcoin in that kind of scenario. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to. Um... Macroll DK underscore bit, BTC. And I found what you said there very interesting. I'm, I'm trying to get my head around um, $500,000 Bitcoin a, a year or two from now and, and the implications on society. Uh, but what, one one of Macroll's questions was uh, if, if you could kind of look at how Bitcoin promotes health and long term planning, you know, as a doctor would see it. I think one of the best things to human health is having a low time preference. You know, Safedine talks about a lot. I see you have the Bitcoin standard there. That was formative for me to read that book back in whatever, 2019 or 2020. Um, if you can quit uh, freaking out about the loss of your purchasing power, and most people don't think that much about it, right? Most people who haven't thought about Bitcoin and don't understand money, they don't understand this. It's not until you realize what money is and what fiat currency is and what its incentive structure is like that you finally can take a step back or away from it and look at your life and look at the effects of fiat on your life. And, and I get this, I think, not, not from being a doctor necessarily as much as being a financial guy. People are desperate to grow their purchasing power over time so that they can afford life and maybe retire someday and maybe support their family someday. And fiat keeps you on the hamster wheel forever and ever and ever. And some people score and they get lucky and they create a tech company and make a billion dollars and they don't have to worry about money. But for 99% of people, they're on this hamster wheel and they're stressed out all the time. And I know a lot of people who tell me, I don't care about money. I don't want to think about money. I, you know, it's just not my thing. And, 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 and I'm like, but you do think about money all the time. You have to think about, you got to get up and go to work and you, you know, you don't, you can barely pay the grocery bills because, because, you know, prices have gone up so much and why is life so hard? And, oh my gosh, I got to pay taxes now. And, you know, I got to put kids through college and all these kind of things are stressful and, and being stressed out all the time, I will tell you now putting back my doctor hat back on is really bad for your health. If you're constantly stressed out, you will just have health problems. It's called psychosomatic problems, right? So you can, if you're stressed out, you'll start having aches and pains. You're going to be at a higher risk for things like cancer, for heart disease, heart attacks, um, you name it. And so stress is bad for your health and fiat is stressful and, and, and being on the hamster wheel forever is stressful and not having enough money to pay the bills and maxing out your credit cards and paying 21% interest rates is super stressful. And so all of that is terrible for your health. And so why do I bring all that up? Because Bitcoin is the exact opposite, right? It gives you a low time preference. It actually not only preserves your purchasing power, but it appreciates your purchasing power over time. You don't have to be a master investor, right? You don't have to come find a financial advisor like me to figure out what investments to put your stuff in. You don't have to work two or three jobs to be able to afford groceries and to help maybe help your kids go through college or to buy a car or something. You just have to work and you have to save a bit more than you spend 
and you have to keep the rest in Bitcoin. And that should preserve and your protect and protect your purchasing power over time for you, for your wife and your kids and for future generations. And having that stress off of your plate where you're not constantly thinking about it, you know, the number one cause of divorce is financial problems in the U.S., can you imagine what would happen to marriage rates and birth rates if people were like, I'm psyched about the future. I'm, I, I, I don't have to think about running out of money. I love my wife. Let's have a bunch of kids. Let's have grandkids. Let's populate this planet. You know, I mean, it's, it's a completely different mindset. And then it doesn't even get into like, I, I talk about it as being, um, oh, can I remember? Um, oh shoot. The, the, oh shoot. I have a term for it and I can't even remember what it is, but basically the next age that's going to come like the age of legends and going back to sort of, you know, 15th, 16th, uh, 16th century Italy, back when we were on this great gold standard in the, you know, the, the, the Venice and the Florence, the kind of the, the, all of the great thinkers and the great builders and the great artists. And we can actually think to build stuff for decades in the future and for centuries into the future. Um, because we know that if you have a sound money that is growing and protecting your purchasing power over time, you can actually look to do projects that last and you can make beautiful things that last for a long time and you can just enjoy life so much more. So that's a really long answer. And I think most people think I'm crazy. Like I'm just, I must be on drugs when I say that, but I really think that's what life on a Bitcoin standard will be like. I think it's going to be just this beautiful long-term focused generational sort of thinking instead of like, I got to buy stuff right now. I got to work three jobs and I'm going to buy a bunch of crap made in China. That's going to break in two hours after I use it. And I'm going to give my kids, you know, 10 presents and all of them are going to be broken in a week from now, you know, and this junky plastic garbage stuff. We're not even going to believe how different life is going to be. I think in a generation from now, because we're not going to have any of that nonsense. It's going to be just beautiful stuff that's built to last. So. Anyways, I could go on forever about that, but I, I can't wait for what life is going to be like on a Bitcoin standard. Yeah, I'd also imagine that we'd see a lot of breakthroughs in even healthcare technology. Sure. Uh, and maybe money spent more wisely in, in pursuit of, of health. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, we can get into, I, I have nothing but, you know, criticism for the healthcare system, but like it's a sick care system. It's, it's, it's inappropriately named. And by the way, people, doctors get a hard time for that. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's, um, they should. I think most people think that doctors are owned by pharmaceutical companies and that's just a, like a meme. That's actually not totally true. I will say that whatever government touches turns to garbage. So healthcare system is kind of taken over by government. So it's super inefficient, super expensive and slow. And it, it kind of works in some ways. I ha you know, American healthcare is awesome when you need it, right? Like if you get in a car accident, and you're bleeding to death and you have broken bones, there's no better place to be than in a US emergency room. They will take care of you. If you have to go in to get surgery, they will fix you and help keep you alive. There are, it's amazing what, uh, what healthcare can, it's, I'm in radiology. It's amazing what we can do with an MRI machine. I can literally see inside of you with a CT scanner and tell you what's going on with your appendix or your small bowel or your liver or whatever, you know, I mean, it's just incredible uh, what imaging can do. There's really amazing things about the U S healthcare, but government has, I think, ruined it and bastardized it just like they've ruined uh, the educational system, just like they've ruined money. I mean, it's all corrupt and awful and bloated and terrible, and it needs a hard reboot. And I think Bitcoin will make all of that much better. And I think the focus will be on when you have that kind of short, or excuse me, the low time preference, longer term thinking, you can start thinking about preventative care much more than I'm running myself into the ground. I'm super stressed out. And now I have some crazy disease and I need to go in and get it fixed to how can I best take care of myself? How can I live kind of a lower stress, more enjoyable life and enjoy better health for and live much longer? So again, I think that's coming also yeah. on a Bitcoin standard. That'd be great. And then so along those lines, if you could orange pill any doctor in the world, who would it be and why? Man, I don't know. I have a lot of doctor friends and I just orange pill them. I, I tell them, you know, they, they'll believe me that Bitcoin is better money most of them still think of it like as a speculative thing, right? Like, oh, you can make a bunch of money. But when they get past that stage, I have my four stages of Bitcoin understanding where you go from skepticism to uh, speculation to uh, an investment or a hedge. And then fourth stage is as uh, just sound money or as a superior savings technology. 
And I tell them if you can get to that point individually where you actually think of it just simply as better money and superior savings technology, why wouldn't you do that for your business? So doctors who are running their own private practice or who in who are in a, a private practice group, they can actually put Bitcoin on their balance sheet and you can start saving uh, you know, for your business, just like you do personally. So it's cool to get rich and to be wealthy, but what if you could do that for your business? And what if you could actually sort of sneak it into healthcare and into your business where you actually grow your, you know, like what MicroStrategy is doing, you have it on your balance sheet and you're suddenly doing 10 times to a hundred times better over every, every four year cycle because you have Bitcoin on your balance sheet you can afford to get the best doctors, you can get extra help and you can have superior patient care. If you're into technology, the technology side of medicine, like I am, you can get the best MRI scanners, you know, the, the greatest technology, and you can do it for cheaper and cheaper prices. You'll actually have deflationary prices for your patients over time. So like all of us are used to paying 10 to 20% more every year for healthcare, which is insane because we're not getting 10 to 20% better quality, just like college is costing 10 to 20% more every year. And you're absolutely not getting 10 to 20% better education every year. Imagine if you could actually give superior healthcare for a cheaper price and you're happier because you have more doctors taking care of relatively less patients so you can spend more time with them, have more nurses, have more healthcare providers on staff and charge less for everybody and everybody's just happy. It's just such a better world. And so that's what I try to talk to my doctor friends. And that's awesome that you're personally into it, but now try to start getting it into your business. And that's phase two, right? As you bring it into your business, there are companies that do that. You know, Parker Lewis is working on some stuff, Swan, Bitcoin, they do some stuff. There are multiple places that help businesses to get it on their balance sheet and to start offering it to their employees and things. So it's just kind of helping the whole world, helping healthcare get on a Bitcoin standard. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I, I think I wonder what grade you would give Warren Buffett as a money manager manager from 1995 on. Oh, uh, C. Yeah, I mean he's ba he's basically just been matching the S and P 500. The only okay. reason he's been sort of outperforming recently is because they finally put Apple in into their portfolio. They've been terrible. Uh, he used to be awesome at be finding these what I call capital efficient businesses kind of under the radar, like C's Candy was a great example, Geico, um, where they could just generate more and more and more money uh, without hardly spending anything more um, on their equipment and things like that. And so they were fantastic. They returned tons of cash to their shareholders. They were great investments. And he just doesn't buy stuff. Like, he's he's all into the old world economy. He still has like newspapers and railroads and all these old things. And that's fine. Uh, but it's basically just like owning the S&P 500 to own uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Right. Um, you recently tweeted, uh, what could cause the price of Bitcoin to surge to 70K to 100K prior to the halving? The trifecta of Santa, the seasonal rally, Fed pause, falling rates, rally, the spot Bitcoin, a spot Bitcoin ETF approval. Otherwise, I think it's unlikely to occur. So uh, I want to ask you, uh, Dr. Crab, I guess, uh, you know, where are you now? What is it? What might it mean to be crabbish? Sure. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of people, you know, stuck with that doc the Dr. Bear uh, moniker. And and so why do I say, cr why, why do I go by crabbish now? Because net liquidity has been trending sideways, chopping sideways in the United States since April of 2022. And it's still in that range. Um, and so until net liquidity breaks out, and basically the only way it can really break out is for quantitative tightening to end, meaning that the Fed has to quit letting... Uh, um, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities roll off of its balance sheet and has to start acquiring them again, basically. So once QE starts again, that will break it out of the, the sideways trend that it's in until it does. So that, so, and there's two different ways to look at this liquidity. One is US net liquidity. That's what we just talked about. That has to do with the Fed's balance sheet. It has to do with what the overnight reverse repo market is doing. And it has to do with the treasury general account and they sort of how they interact with each other. That's been chopping sideways. And then there's worldwide, basically, I say liquidity, but it's kind of like the worldwide monetary supply plus liquidity, which is just the world's money supply is kind of a generic way to think about it. When that trends higher, that tends to affect worldwide investments more. So Bitcoin is more closely tied to that. Actually, NASDAQ stocks and, and you know the, the big tech stocks, the mega cap tech stocks 
um, those are seen as kind of um, um, risk-free almost assets to a lot of uh, nations and businesses around the world, sort of like treasuries are as well. Um, so those kind of things, when we see that move higher, that tends to pull Bitcoin higher and tends to pull, you know, these big mega cap tech stocks higher as well. Um, I'm, so until net liquidity breaks free out of this choppy sideways zone and until that worldwide monetary supply kind of breaks uh, substantially higher, which I think is going to require an event for that to happen. So, so some sort of event where the, where, uh, and we had the first taste of an event with the um, UK, the gilt market back in, in the, I think September of 2022. Uh, and that's when we noticed uh, everything changed right after that. The dollar got weak, bond yields kind of peaked and rolled over. Net liquidity went from declining, declining, declining to it started increasing again and worldwide liquidity did the same. Um, we had a similar event happen, even though there wasn't really a major reason for it, not like the, the guilt crisis. That actually just happened again late October and, and th basically this month, or excuse me, late September, early October of 2023. So both net liquidity and worldwide liquidity are both trending higher again right now. I think that's why we're seeing Bitcoin respond like it's been doing. Uh, it, had a, it took a little breather and then it's been heading higher again. I won't be out of my crabbish mode until net liquidity breaks out of that sideways band that it's been in since April, 2022. So for people who wonder, they're always like, well, when am I going to switch? Like, I'm just waiting for it to finally break out and for a direction to change. In the last month or so, we've seen a significantly spike higher. Um, that has been reflected. You can see when, when US net liquidity is spiking, it's most closely paralleled by um, small cap US stocks. So they, they really were hurting and now they've been surging recently. That's because US net liquidity has been surging again recently. So until something changes, um, I'll continue my view. If, if, if net liquidity breaks out to the upside and breaks out of that range, I will officially declare myself bullish. And if it just cycles again down lower, which it has been doing for a year and a half, I'm just going to stay crabbish, unfortunately. Sure. Well, I love this all weather approach to managing money. I'll leave it to you for any tips, advice that you might have for people to survive these markets. It's brutal out there. And for any parting words and let people know where they can find you and your work. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Cedric. It was a lot of fun uh, being on your show. I appreciate I appreciate the invite. Um, you know, words, I, I think with where we are, even though I'm crabbish from a liquidity perspective, I think with where we are in the Bitcoin cycle and looking ahead based on past performance, which is not indicative of future returns, I got to say that disclaimer, and this is not investment advice, but I'm extremely bullish from where we are. I think this is the time to be accumulating rapidly. Personally, as a value investor, I consider any Bitcoin price, if you have a, a time horizon of five years or more, which I think everybody should, you should hold it for at least five years, if not quite a bit longer um, or forever, ideally. If you have at least a five-year time horizon, I think anything under $70,000 per Bitcoin is a, is just a steal. I think it's a strong buy. I used to write investment advisory articles. And so, you know, I would say that like, you know, strong sell, whatever, or strong buy and somewhere in the range. That's where I consider Bitcoin to be a strong buy. Five year plus five plus year time horizon, anything under 70K, I think is, a, is a, just a steal. So personally, I think this is the time to be stacking sats and to not worry about fluctuations. If it dips lower, say we get some super bad news or we head into this recessionary bear market and the price plunges, I would count that as a blessing and I would try to stack more if you could. You know, if you got to get a second job, this is the time to get a second job to stack more sats and to, you know, tighten your belt, spend less money, don't go on vacation, something if, if you want to, if this is your thing. I, I'm sort of, this is the time where me as a fund manager and a separately managed account guy, this is where I start focusing my portfolios on Bitcoin and away from things like fixed income and real estate and uh, other stocks too, because I think nothing will compare with the performance of Bitcoin over the next two years. I also think over the long run, but those cycles are kind of hard to deal with. Um, like I said, I think this decade, uh, about a 40 to 50% kegger uh, is a reasonable, uh, and I don't think that's being excessive at all, or it's not hyperbolic. I think that's a reasonable expectation for say the next 10 years or so. If people want to find me, uh, I'm on Twitter all the time. My handle is at Vilshire Cap. I, um, I, I like interacting with people on there a lot. I try to put my thoughts. I, I like to be open source with everything. I know a lot of people can't afford advise, an advisor. I'm embarrassed sometimes to even be an advisor, especially in a Bitcoin world. I think Bitcoin will put me out of business and that's great. So I want to bring as many people over to the, the light as, you know, as, as soon as possible and come to Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin and put me out of business and put other advisors out of business. If you want to, uh, you know, interact with me, find me on Twitter or, you know, you can go to Valeshire.com. That's my website. You can send me an email because I run this fund and these separately managed accounts. The email is info at Valeshire.com. Uh, Jeff, I've enjoyed this uh, immensely. I, I agree with you. Bitcoin would probably put me out of business as well. I think it's quite possible at some price point, uh, you know, we'll be in the Bitcoin matrix and uh, maybe it'll be relevant to talk about. So I've enjoyed this immensely. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been so dope. Thanks for having me anytime. Hey, hey, that's a wrap on today's episode of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast with macroeconomic wizard and financial guru, Dr. Jeff Ross. I hope that you found it as fun, informative, and enlightening as I did. Hit us up. We'd love to hear your feedback. I want to thank you for tuning in. Please keep in mind that I only work with the best sponsors and that they are a big reason I can deliver this content for free. So I hope that you will support our sponsors, Alpa for energy bars, River to build your Bitcoin wealth, Thea from Multisig that's super mobile friendly and secure, Hodler's official for the dopest teen Bitcoin merch, Florida Beef Initiative for succulent grass fed beef. And you can also find me at the Bitcoin Advisor, where I'm a phone call away to help with all your Bitcoin needs. Also, you can support me and the show directly on the Fountain app and with tips on Twitter. Finally, if you could write a five-star review for the Bitcoin Matrix podcast wherever you listen to your pods, that would really help get the word out and help new listeners find us when they search for new content. Keep building, keep stacking, always stay laser-focused out there, and let's work to find a way to free Ross. This is Cedric. Peace.